Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is maximizing driver utilization with my friend Mark Elcori. Mark is the CEO and co-founder of AI Fleet, a tech-driven trucking company. For years, we have talked about the driver shortage, but Mark has a very different perspective. Mark says we are not utilizing our drivers efficiently enough. There's not a shortage. We're just not using them efficiently. Mark and the AI Fleet team use a proprietary AI technology to dramatically increase driver utilization. So please check out our conversation. How's it going, Mark? It's going great, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Mark, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Sure. I'm the co-founder and CEO of AI Fleet, calling out of uh, Austin, Texas. And the company is really about, it's a technology trucking company. What we mean by that is that we operate fully as a trucking company, as a motor carrier. However, we have and continue building our own proprietary technology intended at maximizing our driver's utilization and also automating as as much as possible of the operations workflow of the trucking. Yeah, it's interesting when you say AI fleet, you're like, oh, AI fleet, that is not going to be somebody with assets. That's going to be somebody who is a a (laughs) web-based or a SaaS company, right? But you're, you say AI fleet, and again, we're calling this topic maximizing driver utilization, and you already mentioned it. Talk about that ma- utilization problem we have with drivers. Sure. The very easy way to think about a, how a driver operates today is that from a regulation standpoint, every driver can drive about 11 hours a day. However, in the industry, the average is anywhere from five to six hours a day, meaning the average driver drives around five to six hours a day. So when you think about about their utilization from a percentage standpoint, they're typically below 50%, meaning they could be driving an extra, they could almost be doubling the number of driver, the hours that they drive. That's a huge problem because drivers are typically paid based on the number of miles that they drive a day. So that drivers are typically paid by the mile. As you can imagine, if they're only driving half what they could be driving, they're also earning half what they could be earning. And that's why in trucking, turnover is massive. Many large companies operate at anywhere from 100 to 200% driver turnover. And that is almost entirely related to the utilization of the driver, which also means it's also a problem for the trucking company because turnover is expensive. But also when driver is not driving, the truck is not rolling either, which means the companies, the trucking companies are using, are, are, are losing an earning opportunity on their assets. And so the entire idea behind AI fleet is how do you actually utilize vesting class algorithms to learn driving patterns and maximize the driver's utilization? Yep. Now, you just mentioned we're losing half. So they're driving five and a half hours and they have an opportunity to drive 11. Uh, we're going to leave a little cliffhanger here and come back to that. <laughs> so you can't leave right away before you hear the punchline. Because that, that is, we talked before we hit record about, do we have a driver shortage or do we just have a very difficult job that has a hard time keeping good people? And I think it's more the latter than the former. You're right. And in many ways, they are related because the when you think if everybody, you know, when, at the average of five hours a day of driving, if that is what we assume a driver can drive, then you do have a driver shortage. And so when we talk about the driver shortage, we're almost thinking of Truly, if if all our drivers on average are driving five and a half hours a day, we may not have enough drivers. But is the solution to that problem adding more drivers or is a solution to utilize our existing drivers better? And this is where we are definitely on the latter camp. What what adding more drivers to the system will do, because at the end of the day, when we think about it in in the US, we have about four in, in full truckloads specifically, this 400, 500 billion dollar market. The more drivers you add into it, the lower the earning per driver will be, right? The lower the utilization the driver will be. So adding more drivers will truly exacerbate a very big problem that we already have. And our view is that's just not the right way to do it. We don't want to add 
we don't want to necessarily encourage just adding more drivers to solve the driver shortage. We should first utilize our existing drivers better. And this has very big repercussions because by utilizing drivers better, first of all, you're improving their earning potential. That's a good thing. Driving is extremely hard. Truck driving specifically is extremely hard. Being away from home for days and weeks at a time is extremely hard. Drivers deserve better pay. The second thing is turnover is expensive for trucking companies. So solving the turnover problem by making your drivers and your trucks get more miles is truly a very helpful uh, way to solve the driver shortage problem. And the third thing, and that's actually really important, is safety. The more you incur, the more you have drivers who are experienced, and the more you have drivers who are getting used to not encouraging drivers just coming out of school just to solve the driver shortage problem, it is critical to make sure that we are better utilizing our existing drivers first. And that's why we really started the company is with the whole idea of better utilization of truck drivers. Yep. I love it. I love it. So Mark, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you started AI Fleet. Sure. I actually grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, and then I moved to the U.S., to go to grad school, I went to UC Berkeley. I did a master's in civil engineering there. And then I worked in construction for a little while. After that, I did my master's in business administration at New York University. That's where I moved to consulting, to management consulting. And this is how I got into trucking, really. So first, I, I was in the private equity and M&A practice of a management consulting firm called AT Carney. And just happened to stumble into a lot of diligence and M&A deals between trucking companies buying each other or private equity buying uh, trucking companies. And eventually ended up working at US Express, which was at that time the, the fifth largest trucking company initially as a consultant, but then I joined them full time as chief strategy officer. And then after US Express, I had the opportunity to work at the third largest trucking company in Europe, uh, who was also, and this is where we really learned how similar the European market is to the US market, meaning a lot of the same challenges that we find today, which is the low driver utilization and the high turnover is almost exactly the same in the US as in Europe. And again, a lot of the challenges that we that I started learning along with this experience was just the non-optimal assignment of loads to drivers. And that is behind the our obsession that my co-founder and I have about had about solving, how do you utilize algorithms to truly assign the best load for each driver, and not just for today, but for the whole week, right? We call it from home to home. How do you make sure drivers get as much home time as possible while maximizing their hours of service? And that is why we decided to start AI Fleet. Initially, we, we thought about, should we sell the technology? But our view was, if given how big the problem is, why not approach it ourselves by trying to build our own technology and build our own operations around the technology? And that's why today AI Fleet is not a software company. It's a, we call it a full stack company, meaning we build our own software, but we operate our own assets as well. Yeah. And by the way, if you were to sell that as software as a service, which by the way, might have been a very good option, it seems like you've done pretty well already. You've got a lot of trucks and really cool software. But I think a lot of people would say, Oh, well, yeah, we already have a software for that. We can, we already have, we off, we have all these, we have all these technologies that allow us to maximize our driver utilization. And then that begs the question, why is the average driver driving five and a half hours rather than 11? And so in a lot of ways, you're, you're eating your own cooking over there. <laughs> you're not <Absolutely>. saying that. <laughs> and, and so what is the ace of the, and the industry average is five and a half hours out of 11. Do you mind sharing what you guys are at? How many hours your drivers get? Sure. We're about 40 to 50% above industry average. So we're approaching about just about eight hours a day. Now I want to clarify when we talk about the five and a half hours for the industry and the eight hours for AI fleet, that is not just for drivers who are on the road. That's for all our drivers, right? Those are the drivers we count everybody who is at home. We count everybody who is in the shop doing maintenance. All of this is part of when we talk about the averages for the industry and the average for AI fleet. But yeah, today we're, we're the average driver, the average solo driver drives just below 1,500 loaded miles a week in the US, whereas at AI fleet we're just about 2,200 miles plus. But one big caveat is that in the industry, it's very common for drivers to be out for 
two to three weeks at a time, whereas at AF Fleet, the vast majority of our drivers go home every single week. And our technology allows us to maximize the utilization while making sure that our drivers are home with their families every single week. Now, are you seeing as a result of that, are you seeing lower turnover among drivers? Significantly lower turnover. I would say our average turnover is about 60 to 70% below industry average. We have very low voluntary turnover. And that is a big, for us, that is a big testament to the success of the technology and how our operations is built around. Yep. And we all, before we hit record, we were talking about this driver shortage. And we were both had read an article that Craig Fuller had written not so long ago, a few weeks ago. And uh, that would have been in October, I believe. Uh, he wrote an article saying he doesn't believe we have a driver shortage. So why don't you elaborate on that? Would it to, to, to get inside Craig's head for a moment and tell us what he's thinking? Yeah, we at least I and, and all of us actually fully agrees with Craig on that. There's actually a very interesting. That was about three years ago when utilization has been going down, and utilization has been going down as the supply chain keeps redistributing its warehouses to get closer to, to population centers. What's interesting today is that the average length of haul, the average distance of between a pickup and a delivery is just about 400 miles. That used to be about 750 to 800 miles about 10 years ago. And as that average length of haul has kept decreasing over time, the utilization has really followed suit because as you can imagine, it's harder to stitch together a series of loads for a driver four or five to get 2,000 miles versus what it used to be 10 years ago, where maybe two or three loads would get you those 2,000 miles. And so there's this very interesting MIT study from three years ago when utilization was maybe about 10% above where it is today, where one of the researchers said that if every driver in America drove 15 minutes more per day, only 15 additional minutes a day, there would not be a driver shortage. Today, I would say that's getting exacerbated even more as the utilization has kept going down. And so when you think about the utilization of a driver, meaning that a driver uses less than 50% of their available time for driving, it just tells you mathematically you could not have both an underutilization of the driver and a driver shortage. Cannot be. And so truly to, to the point of how do you solve that? we need to make our current drivers drive more. It is the right thing to do for the company, and it's the right thing to do for the drivers as well. So most drivers are paid by the mile, correct? That is correct, yes. So I heard somebody say this not so long ago. When the ELD mandate came out, when was that? Five years ago, seven years ago? 2018, it became mandated. Yes, that's correct. So when the ELD mandate came, in effect, it reduced our capacity, right? Now, theoretically, everyone was following the hours of service religiously, but we believe that probably some were not, that now all of a sudden we had less. And I haven't had him on in a while, but Dean Croak, who was at Freight Waves at the time and is now over at DAT, he's done a lot of research on this. And he would say it probably hasn't reduced accidents at all. Um, but what it has taken is some of the capacity that we once had off and again, the drivers also don't get to decide when they drive. And Mark, if you were going to drive from Austin, Texas to Detroit, you say, I'm going to jump in the car to go see Joe and we're going to go to lunch and I'm going to drive when I feel like I'm fit to drive. And if I'm not fit to drive, I will stop at a hotel and sleep. No one tells you how many hours to drive. Now, we've decided we want to limit the drivers and I think that's some good guardrails to put up, but... We also know that, I told you, I see drivers occasionally by my house there at Tractor Supply, and they are waiting around for their hours. So they're not sleeping. They're sitting around waiting for hours so they can drive home. And that's they live an hour or two on the other side of Ohio. So they're driving. I want to drive two hours to go home, but I can't, not until I'm my hours are back. And my hours back, yeah. Yeah. So when we talk about driver's utilization being at 50%. What is it, What are the other hours being, what are we doing with all this? Are, are they waiting around to be loaded and unloaded? Is that all of it? Or ex please explain, elaborate. Maybe just hitting on the ELD mandate, when you trace back utilization of a driver over time, there is certainly an extra decrease once the ELD mandate was introduced. 
So the data does show that utilization was hit a little bit after the introduction of the ELD mandate. Uh, but when it comes to, not to answer your question, but where, what are the sources of waste? I think load on load time is talked a lot about a lot in the industry, especially in 21 and 22, when there was this massive demand. And, and this is where everybody was talking about the driver shortage again. A lot was being blamed on the load on load times. And there is no question. There is a lot of waste. It takes about one and a half to, to three hours very often to load or unload a truck. But that is really only one of the sources of waste that a driver encounters. The other sources of waste are, of course, deadhead or empty miles, which is driving from your delivery to your next pickup. There's a very big source of waste, which is the human problem of trucking. And it's the time it takes for a dispatcher to assign a load to a driver. Very often, dispatchers assign loads to drivers only after the driver is empty. And after the driver is empty, it's just like the folks you, you were meeting next to your home. Sometimes a driver can tell you, well, I'm waiting because I'm waiting for my dispatcher to tell me which load I have to book next. That is a source of waste that needs to be zero in the industry. Now, the fourth source of waste that I would say is very often disregarded, but it's actually one of the largest sources of waste in the industry is arriving too early to your appointment. So go back to the ELD mandate you're, you're, you were just talking about. The ELD mandate, once you start your clock, you're on the clock. You have 14 hours a day where you should be allowed to drive, and you're allowed to drive 11 hours of those 14 hours where you're allowed to drive. And so if a load is assigned to you that doesn't take into account your ELD hours, your available hours of service, it is very probable that you're going to arrive too early to your appointment but those hours where you are waiting for your appointment, those hours go away from your allow allowable hours. And so the ELD mandate has certainly exacerbated a little bit the utilization, but it's not as much the ELD mandate as much as just not assigning the right load, taking into account the available hours for the driver. And those are the, the really big sources of waste. Arriving too early to the appointment is really... If, if we had to focus one only one place in the industry, that is probably where you will find the majority of the hours get wasted. This is also that in, what increases the driver frustration, because if you're sitting waiting for your appointment, there's just nothing for you to do. At least when you're driving empty, you're driving empty. It's horrible for the environment, but the driver feels useful. When you're arriving too early to an appointment, you just can't do anything. And very often your truck is idling, which is also terrible for the environment. Right. What about drop and hook? That is one way we can say with the loading and unloading and arriving early is no longer a problem if I can just unhook and drive away. Yeah, it, 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 I would say it depends, right? Because you're, it also depends on is your trailer loaded once you get to that facility? And is your trailer, are you able to drop it? And is there room for you to drop the truck? But you'll notice with a lot of the large carriers who typically experience slightly worse utilization metrics than the very small carriers, even though they only have drop and hook, is that there's a lot of problems that come with drop and hook. There is no question that it solves a lot. However, the, there's also a pretty significant cost that comes for the carrier, which is the, you're very often forced to maintain a three to one or a four to one trailer to tractor pool. And that's a lot of cost for the trucking companies as well. And so while it will help you solve the load on load time, it doesn't always help you solve the arrive too early because often you're not allowed to, often your trailer may not be loaded if you arrive too early to, to a location. Sometimes it could be, but other times it might not be. So you still have that put. Now, I'm just curious, do you guys uh, have... Do you do a lot of drop and hook? Is that part of the uh, winning equation that you guys have? Right now, we're not doing a lot. I would say a very small percentage of our freight is drop and hook. It's below 5%. That is something that we are looking to progressively increase over time because a lot of our customers are demanding it. Uh, but that, today, we just haven't had the, the ability to it cost a lot of money to acquire more trailers. And right now, we're being a little bit cautious, especially in this market. Yeah, I understand. And again, it's what all these solutions that even drop and hook to some extent is trying to brute force the solution. Now, when we talk about freight brokerage or 3PL, we've had a ton of investment and where we say we're going to automate things. We're going to start using the data that we've acquired to start making better decisions using data analytics, but also using AI. Not everybody's doing the same. I know some are. It's a huge industry. Can ever there's we generalize and be wrong. 
what are you guys doing to 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 alleviate these problems? And I, I'm gonna li- I'm gonna list them real quick: the loading and unloading time that's waste, waiting to be dispatched, arriving too early, and driving empty. What are you guys doing so you can elim- not eliminate, minimize, the- reduce, minimize, so you can maximize driver utilization? What is AI fleet doing? We look at all these four sources of waste holistically. And so what our algorithm does is that it's not looking at trying to minimize only one of them. We see a lot in the industry, for example, especially on the freight broker side, uh, talk a lot about just the minim- uh, minimizing deadhead, which is absolutely the right thing to do. Very often, if you're only minimizing one source of waste, you end up adding additional sources of waste. And so what our algorithms do is that they look at all of these sources of waste at once and try to minimize the entire net, the, the waste among the entire network. And so we're never looking at, a, at an assignment. We have a driver who's going to be empty tomorrow, let's say, in Austin. We're never looking at what's the best thing out of Austin. What we're looking at is what is the best thing out of Austin that also maximizes driver utilization tomorrow and the day after and the day after until this driver goes home. So it's this holistic approach, what we call the, the home-to-home planning, that we are look, where we are looking to minimize those. And so the way our algorithms work is that they look at the entire availability of freight that we have access to. Now that's broker freight, but that's also freight that customer freight that AI fleet has. And we're able to look at how to assign this, these roads to driver, taking into account every individual driver differently. If you and I were driving a truck, Joe, we probably wouldn't be driving in the same way. We would drive it at maybe different speeds, I might need to take additional breaks. This is critical, though, because if our algorithms is assigning freight for a truck, the human behind the truck may not be able to deliver that freight. And so we've been collecting data. Every time a driver joins us, we try to learn their driving patterns, and our algorithms keep adjusting the different ways of assigning freight to that particular driver so that, because again, we're, we're a trucking company, right? We're actually moving the freight so that we are sure that we're able to pick up and deliver the freight on time. Uh, and that's how our algorithms have been progressively getting better the more data we collect on our individual right. drivers. It's, it's interesting. It, 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 listening to you talk, you start with the driver and go outward rather than looking at the lanes and, and the trucks going the other way. It's Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever, ever got into like theory of constraints, but it's almost like that kind of viewpoint, looking at the driver as the bottleneck. And I, I don't mean it in a negative way, in a way that let's, how do we alleviate this bottleneck? Yeah. I mean, we look at drivers are in many ways, the only ones at AI fleet, but also at any trucking company that generate revenue. They are the ones moving the freight from, from point to point. They're also utilizing our most expensive uh, piece of equipment, our trucks, and they're utilizing. So between the driver the truck and the fuel, that is where the majority of the cost and expense of the trucking company is. And so not looking at the human who actually controls those three elements of cost, the driver pay, the equipment pay, and the fuel pay, we just never quite understood how that would work for the trucking company. And so, yes, we're obsessed truly with the utilization of the driver. We're obsessed with making our drivers happy. Because as I said, they control a lot of our costs themselves so that we are able to maximize our profitability per truck. That's interesting. So if you and I right now were put in charge of a surgery center, it would be, we would say, okay, these doctors who perform the surgery, they all get paid very good money. They're all, they're half a million dollars a year that we have to pay them. So let's maximize the amount of surgeries they're able to do. Let's put people around them, nurses, med techs, admins, to help them stay focused on surgeries. So we get the maximum amount of surgeries in a day. And then, but that's easy because we know those guys make a half a million dollars a year or more, right? When When we get over to the trucking business, we don't treat truckers the same way. And somebody might say, yeah, but because they're not the highest paid resource unless you tie them to a truck. <laughs> the truck only moves with that driver. Absolutely. And the, what's interesting here is that in, in trucking, we talk a lot about everything is on a per mile basis. And so if you ask somebody, what's your average equipment cost? I'll tell you, oh, it's 30 cents a mile. 
Maybe, because it actually depends how many miles the driver is driving. Because in, in many ways, you could take a truck and if you put a very, if you utilize the driver behind the truck, your cost, your mileage cost on that equipment actually goes down. It's almost because a big chunk of the cost of the truck is fixed. Now, of course, there's a variable component for maintenance and also the resale value. It depends on the number of miles. However, the fixed cost component of a truck, the more loaded miles, the more revenue miles you drive, the lower your actual cost because you're amortizing those fixed costs over additional miles. The only way to do that is to look at the human who is driving the truck. And so our obsession with drivers is not only the right thing to do for the driver, it's also the right thing to do for us as a company if we're looking at minimizing our cost per mile and maximizing our revenue per mile. Interesting. Interesting. Again, I think you guys, again, the name is AI Fleet. And I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, I'll put a link to your website and any other links you and your marketing team give me, I'll put those in the show notes. But one of the things I've, I'm not an expert in AI like you are and your team is, but I did read some books on it. And I do talk to a lot of people who just talk about AI. And am I right to say that when you bring AI, it is artificial intelligence. Some of the solutions it suggests are counterintuitive to humans. Absolutely. And, and for us, when we were thinking about how to start the company, the counterintuitive solutions are why we wanted to build our own trucking company and not sell software. We knew that often solution might require a driver to do something that, yeah, I would say the average dispatcher would not expect and the average dispatcher might think is a mistake. And the only way for us to get our models to get better over time is to actually execute and get the feedback directly so that the technology gets better. That always worried me about trucking companies and how good as an industry we are overall in terms of purchasing software. And what we're doing today here is we're almost forcing ourselves to utilize our technology, but also provided feedback so that it keeps getting better. But so you're 100% right. Yeah. I remember, please push me into the shell. And if I start going astray here, <laughs> I remember reading a book and it said that when you get, you're trying to get into a new software or something, and it says you have to tell us which one of these is, uh, is a, a stop sign and you have to keep clicking. And then at some point, Occasionally, the robot tells me that I'm a robot. And I'm like, no, you're the robot. I'm the human. <laughs> right? <laughs> From what I understand, Google and some of the other companies are using this as recognition. So they now can use that and they can upload that to their AI. And that's the way AI is exposed to all of the way we view these and say, yes, that is a stop sign. One of the things I, I also learned is that if you were and I were to see a a cat. I would recognize a cat. I might only see the tail. And I remember, oh, the, I have a cat at the house, so I recognize that's a cat's tail. But you might say, I recognize it's got two eyes, it's got these pointy ears, cute little nose, right? Whiskers, mouth. What they, what I seem to remember is AI was recognizing cats in very different ways than humans would. And I'm sure that that it's much more sophisticated than than that, but Again, it speaks to the counterintuitive nature of using AI to solve things, because if it says to you, Mark, you need to do this, and of course, you develop the software with your team, so you believe it, but I can imagine somebody else going, AI is stupid. I do not believe it. <laughs> it's artificial intelligence for a reason. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And trucking has a lot of counterintuitive lanes. Tr the trucking lanes are counterintuitive. You know, what, one example is if you're in Dallas and a driver lives in Los Angeles and, and needs to be there as soon as possible, one way to think about which load you get that driver is a load that goes from Dallas to Los Angeles because it will get the driver there and will be loaded. That would actually typically, especially if you're in the spot market, the, we would make less money sending the driver from Dallas to Los Angeles than we would if we send the driver from Dallas to Flagstaff, Arizona. Even though Flagstaff is exactly on the right way, typically a load that goes to Arizona would pay more than a load that goes to Los Angeles because of just the difference in, in the inbound markets and the, the commoditized, the supply demand in Los Angeles. Now, you would be driving the exact same number of miles, but by driving the shorter miles, you will make more money. And that means that you might have to drive empty 
from Flagstaff to Arizona to, to Los Angeles. However, as a driver and as a company, you made more money by making that choice. Is it, does it feel right to do that? Absolutely not. Is it the right thing for the driver and the company? In this particular example, Absolutely, yes. It's also interesting what you said about being driver-centric. And again, everyone wants to be driver-centric. I think a lot of companies treat their drivers well. But what I mean by that is the business model that you have is driver-centric. How do we, you're looking at this driver as part, as, as the most expensive resource. And the reason it's the most expensive resource isn't because trucking salaries are as super high. We want them to be higher for the most part. And, but it's because, because they're connected to the truck. The truck only moves with the driver. So I can no longer just say, yeah, the driver and the truck are separate. Not if, not when they're being useful, they aren't. <laughs> if a driver, and by the way, not people are useful in general, but a driver who's not driving isn't productive. A truck that's not driving isn't productive. The only time they're both productive is when they're together. And again, this is very basic, but I don't think that's how we view the world all the time. I completely agree with you. And yes, we, our obsession with being driver centric is by recognizing that if we're going to, we can keep complaining as an industry about the driver shortage and there's just not enough drivers out there, or we can just look inward and say, what tools do we have today to solve that problem? And I think the tool, the only tools that we have today is just a better utilization of our existing drivers for their own sake, but also for the industry's sake. Yeah. And so you're keeping drivers longer. Are you able to pay your drivers more because they are utilized more? Our drivers are driving on average 40% to 50% more miles a week. And as you can expect, their total pay will be will reflect that. And we don't believe drivers stay at AI fleet only because we like them and we treat them well. At the end of the day, they have to watch out for what is good for them from a financial perspective as well. We, we do believe, though, that the reason, one of the main reasons our retentions are so much higher is because at the end of the day, we pay our drivers fair, but also we pay them much better than industry average, mostly because of how much better we work with them on their utilization. Yeah, by the way... Um, I'm an automotive guy, so I always look at the world in terms of utilization. When I was young, we had the CAD systems, the computer-aided design systems, were <laughs> tied to mainframes. And we would work those CAD systems 22, 24 hours a day. I remember my first job on the CAD system, I had to come in at 7 at night and stay till. Wait, I got there at 7.30 at night and went home at 7 in the morning. And it's because we wanted to run those. And then when I would leave, someone else would show up and work on that computer until 5, 30, 6 o'clock. <laughs> and because they were very expensive, each station was 125 grand back in the day. So that was something that we had to run. And if you go to a, a, an assembly plant or factory, you'll see them often working multiple shifts uh, and using the same machines with a little bit of time for scheduled maintenance. Same thing in trucking. What drives me crazy, my soapbox here for a moment, I live close to Ann Arbor, loved my University of Michigan football team. Eh, I tolerate my old university. They've done some good <laughs> things. But when I walk by the University of Michigan, they are constantly building buildings. The only, only industry in the world that continues to build at that rate are universities. They don't usually have people in the schools on the weekend, and they don't have people at night in those buildings. And yet they reject kids from the school. They're like, oh no, we only can take 50,000. They could, if you and I were running a big university, we'd say, we're going to triple enrollment. And that's not even counting online. We would easily triple enrollment because you should. Utilization is truly, a, a, you were talking about the doctors earlier. So but like the, the hospital problem and the and empty hospital beds and empty office buildings and empty real estate. It's as a society, our utilization of our current existing assets better. There's so much talk about carbon footprint. The easiest way to reduce carbon footprint today is better utilizing the assets that we have. That's in trucking. Yeah. And you think about your car. Everyone says, oh, I need my own car. Do you? How many hours a week do you actually drive your car? I know I drove to the gym today already. That's uh, five minutes away. I will drive somewhere else later, a half hour. So basically, I will own my car 
I'll pay for 24 hours for it because I need it 24 hours. But the reality is I'm going to drive it far less than an hour. And some days, not at all. And all those vacation homes in northern Michigan, million dollar houses on the lake, they're used what? 10 days a year, 30 <laughs> days a year. <laughs> you're like, so we have that. You're right. That's when we talk about sustainability, we need to start using some of these resources more efficiently. Yeah. And, and trucking is a little different specifically because there's the human behind the asset. Yes. Yes. And so it's really those two elements together. Why we're, when we think about, there's a lot happening in trucking today. Of course, there's a very big freight recession, but our view is that when people think about capital, and of course, a lot of capital has went to you know, brokers and, and other parts of the industry. Our view is that the pro- what is the problem that we, are sol- we should be solving as an industry? It seems like we agree almost that drivers are not well utilized. It seems like a lot of people agree there, but then we approach the solution differently. We, we sometimes approach the solution with the wrong premise of the driver shortage. But if we all agree that utilization is the problem, then that is a problem that we should be solving today. And again, that's the whole idea behind the genesis of AI fleet. Yeah. And I want to ask a few more basic questions about trucking in general. Beyond the utilization, one of the things I think we've seen in this market is that it, it can get very cutthroat when it comes to pricing. And a lot of people will say, yeah, if you don't do scheduled maintenance, if you don't pay your drivers, if you skimp on insurance, if you take a a whole bunch of shortcuts, you can be less expensive, but you're also bringing a lot of risk to the party. But to some shippers and some brokers, they're like, I'm going to pretend that risk isn't there. I'm going to pretend that guy's $150 cheaper because he's found a way to be more efficient. Please speak to that. (laughs) Yeah, there's certainly, it's a cyclical market. And now we're certainly in this very rough recession and it does feel like it's a race to the bottom. And where, to bring it back a little bit to the main point of utilization, when when everybody, it's so easy for anybody to come into trucking today, because whether you work for yourself or you work for a large trucking company, you typically will drive about the same number of miles. You drive around 1,500, 1,600 loaded miles. Where efficiency becomes so important is that you start taking control of, you, you start putting all of these elements under one bucket. Yes, utilization is important, and the only way to maximize utilization is by having uh, best-in-class maintenance, is by abiding to best-in-class safety protocols. And as a shipper, if you truly care, most shippers' websites today talk about sustainability. If you truly care about those elements and, and the emissions of your suppliers, the easiest way to tackle that problem is by selecting suppliers who have efficiency as part of their mode of operations. And with efficiency, it means that you don't have to get, if there was a little bit of a slightly better consolidation in the industry, I don't know that there's always a need for a million different trucking companies. That actually allows you as a supplier, to, as a customer, to manage your suppliers better and to make them accountable for their efficiency and how they're treating how they're treating their employees and their assets. And that allows you to make better pricing decisions as well. So we do see those two elements very related. I had Blake Gromus, the vice president of safety from Ruan on my truck, on the podcast over at Ruan Trucking. And he said something I thought was interesting. He said, we're never the lowest price. He said, nor do we aspire to be. He goes, what we are is we are the, in our mind, the safest. We are putting we do the scheduled maintenance. We do all the right things. We pay our drivers right. We, te- we treat everybody the way they should be treated. So we can't be the lowest price. And so he said, what it comes down to is people with shared values, our shared values buy from us. And that I'm assuming you, you find yourself in a place where you say, there's just certain kind of business that I can't talk about because it doesn't fit our values. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we can be part of the, the race to the bottom and the industry is pushing us towards. Yep. So who's your sweet spot? Who do you, who does AI fleet work with? Now, I know this. Drivers want to work with you. <laughs> but what shippers want to work with you? Today, shippers who value efficiency, who, who are truly serious about reducing their carbon emissions, those shippers work with us. 
today, to be fair, as a, as a fairly new company, a lot of our freight also comes from brokers. However, we are continuously expanding our direct to shipper relationship. Uh, today, we work with a lot of CPG and, and paper companies, and our goal is to continue expanding, again, looking at, at truly looking at customers who see trucking not just as who's, the, who's my cheapest supplier. We've had customers that way, and we recently pulled out from one of them because that is just not the kind of company we want to operate. So shippers who are truly serious about uh, their CO2 emissions I think we, we could be the right supplier for that. So explain again why you guys are better for the CO2 or reducing the CO2 emissions. With our 40% higher utilization, you get two significant improvements from the CO2 emission. First of all, our empty miles, our deadhead is about 50% below industry average because with our technology, we're able to optimize for deadhead as one of the sources of waste. The second one is by driving, you're basically shipping more loads with fewer trucks. What that means is that, in a way, if you were to extrapolate our efficiency to the entire industry, you could think that you need 30% fewer trucks in the entire supply chain than you need today to move the exact same number of to, to move the exact same number of freight that we have today. Uh, and as you know, in the industry, not every trucking company, when you go back to those who are okay without scheduled maintenance, they don't drive with the same fuel efficiency that the best of class trucking companies do. That is a lot of emissions that we could be tackling by favoring uh, carriers who take emissions seriously. Are you mostly dry van? We are entirely dry van. Okay. And you're based in Austin? And we're based in Austin, Texas, correct. So what's next for AI Fleet? Give us a glimpse into the future. Our obsession is about continuing to optimize our technology. Our end, our, I would say our end vision is, could we continue operating in this full truckload, long haul network while utilizing the technology to make sure every single driver is home every single day. That for us is the end vision, meaning utilizing the technology, not just to program the routes today to get the driver home at the end of the day, but to program the routes today so that to to get the drivers home every day while swapping trailers with other drivers as well, so that all our drivers who want to be home every day get to be home every day. So this is the part of the technology that we are obsessing with right now and starting to build out what the vision could be like. Uh, and then also we want to continue growing. Today we operate about 155 trucks uh, and have about 155 drivers on our payroll. All our drivers are employees of the company with benefits. And our goal is to try to get closer to maybe doubling that by the end of next year. Wow, that's some serious growth. I hope all of us get a chance to grow. We've had some down months. Is it your sense? I know you you don't know more than I do, but is it your sense that the first quarter things might start? We might start seeing a little sunlight again. We're certainly hoping, just like the rest of the industry, we're we're starting to see some trends. We we aggregate a lot of data from different customers and different different participants in the supply chain, we're certainly starting to see volume tick up a little bit. And we're starting to see, certainly we're seeing the rates adjust, at least stop falling, which is the first time maybe in the, in the last 22 months. So we Hello. are optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Still maybe a little early to, to say that we're out of it, but at least it certainly seems like the, the trend is hopefully to at least stop falling. Excellent. I love what you guys are doing. So what conferences will we see you and the AI fleet people at in the coming year? We're still, we're still developing our schedule for next year. Last year, I was at Manifest. It was a great conference. I also participated in a the panel there. I participated in a panel at the American Trucking Association's MCE conference here in Austin. Those are the ones that we usually try to attend. We haven't finalized our schedule for next year, but those are the ones that we're at least hoping to be part of. Yeah, but if they want to find you now, I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, link link to your website, and any other links that your marketing team gives me. I'll put those in the show notes. And Mark, thank you so much for sharing what you guys are doing. I think you're absolutely on the right track. And I, I love that you're using technology for a problem that we've all struggled with for so long, which is making we call it maximizing driver utilization, but it's also it's making drivers' lives so much better, which is part of keeping them around. <laughs> Absolutely. Joe, thank you so much for having me on. Yep, my pleasure. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. 
You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.